I'm here today with my friend Mark Levin. He's a director and producer and head of Blowback Productions, making a documentary film called Class Divide. Mark, thanks for joining us. Good to be here, Rod. So, we showed this film to our staff, and at the end of the film, a retired former financier at a major institution whose children had gone through private school stood up in front of this entire staff and he said, that's one of the most powerful films I've seen in years. And he had tears coming down his cheek and he went in to talk to us about how what you brought out was all these feelings that he had had about having two children in private school in the New York metropolitan area and yet that tension that comes out in Classified between those on one side of the street in an expensive private school and people with wonderful potential on the other side of the street not allowed in. Well that touches me to hear you know something like that because um, I think part of uh, the gamble in the film was that we didn't make a kind of linear expository film, we made a film that is full of emotion, that you see feelingly. As you just said, uh, this gentleman responded. In other words, there's an emotional connection that you make with the characters, the kids on these two sides of the street. Uh, and we didn't go in with an agenda to, you know, kind of uh, condemn or expose either side. The, the, the refreshing thing about using children as kind of a way in is uh, they're not burdened with all the political uh, rhetoric uh, and positions that we've all grown up with. So you get fresh eyes. Uh, so uh, it's great to hear something like that. That's what a, a filmmaker dreams of hearing. Well, what I was moved by is not only fresh eyes, but fresh hearts. And what really stood out to me in watching this film is how on both sides of the street people were troubled. Well, I think, Rob, you just put your finger on what was the biggest revelation for me in making the film. Uh, obviously, the uh, excitement and adventure of making documentaries is you're kind of not necessarily sure where it's going to lead you or how it's going to work out. Uh, and what amazed me was what I saw, which is really echoing your observation, was that the common ground between the kids of privilege that go to Avenues the World School and the kids from low-income public housing project across the street was a kind of shared anxiety about where do we fit in in a world that is changing so fast right in front of our eyes. You would think the kids that are well off would have more confidence and yet they know they're competing now with the Chinese kids, the Indian kids, the Korean kids, that, that it's a new game. They're not just mm, comp mm. competing with Fieldston and Riverdale. And you would think that yes, the kids that have to struggle on the other side of the street, sure, but even they sense that it's changing so fast that what they once took for granted, which is that we have a social safety net, public housing, unemployment insurance, you know, different programs, they're all being taken away. Everything's being privatized. We're, we're, we're shattering and, and shredding that safety net. So even they don't have what once was there for their parents and grandparents. So it is amazing that besides popular culture, which obviously all kids share, the music, the movies, the TV, it is this anxiety about a world that is changing so fast and that you see literally right in front of your eyes, buildings going up and buildings coming down. Where do I fit into that world? Yeah. And what was remarkable is, how would I say, my priors would be, the guys, the men and women inside avenues would feel safer than the people outside. But what I learned in the film is that the people inside avenues didn't think they could be sure they were there because of merit. They could be sure they were there because their parents had money. But that isn't a lot of protection. Well, I think you've put your finger on something, you know, and I haven't really, really thought it through, uh, but that is profound, which is instead of pitting, you know, rich against poor, privilege against unprivileged, it's that, hey, an unequal society threatens all of us. And all our children are at risk in one way if that's the world they're growing up in. 
Uh, and that is potentially can bring people with very different political perspectives or economic, you know, uh, kind of uh, answers and programs and policies. Uh, that's the beginning of at least bringing them together. Yeah, well, there should be a correspondence between what you might call your ability, the value you create, how you're compensated in all aspects of life for the system to be legitimate. Absolutely. And when that correspondence isn't there at a formative time, like education, it's very unsettling. Because things that can go in your favor in one chapter can go against you in the next one. Well, that makes me, th there's a scene, right, in the film, it just coming back to me, where, where one of the kids says, I feel guilty. You know, that I'm here, I could be right across the street. Yeah. You know, but by fate, I'm here because of my parents, you know. And I don't want to feel bad about that, but I do feel sometimes burdened by it. I think the other thing that's quite moving as you watch this and you think about those who have access to education and those who don't, some would demonize this private school system. But in my watching, I said the Avenue School is doing a good thing. It's creating a good education establishment, an excellent education establishment, when one didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. And because they did that, and not everyone has that, doesn't mean they did bad. It means we all have to do more with our public school system. I was once uh, cheered in a, in a panel for saying, the one policy that I would most recommend is to eliminate private schools so that the wealthy and the powerful had to raise the tide of all boats by making the public school system good. I don't think Avenue is doing something bad. I think society is shown to be doing something bad by what Avenue is doing well. Well, first of all, your suggestion, it's a fascinating one, and it's so missing, and I'm saying uh, doing away with uh, private education. Well, obviously, we're moving in the total opposite direction, which is privatizing <laughs> almost all education except for people who can't afford it. Uh, and I recently saw Michael Moore's film, uh, Where Do We Invade Next? And one of the moments that actually stood out to me was where he looked at Finland, uh, where, I never knew this, private schools are banned. Uh, there's no homework. They are the highest testing students in the world. Mm -hmm. Finland is number one in terms of when they do these, somehow these global educational tests. So look, I agree with you. Um, I mean, it's interesting because my, my I, I lived in this neighborhood. I mean, I think that's part of what uh, made the film personal in a way. Um, and uh, I've been 40 years in that neighborhood. In fact, when I moved onto 26th Street was with a bunch of guys, it was uh, a factory building, a garment factory building, and it was a party loft. You know, we were freaks. Uh, <laughs> when my wife moved in with me and we started domesticating my, the place, I'll never forget when my future in-laws came to visit, my wife's mother started crying. She couldn't believe her daughter ended up <laughs> in a factory on 26th Street. You know? <laughs> uh, now I've got a Hilton, you know, literally two buildings down. Soledad O'Brien lives upstairs. I mean, you know, I have seen this neighborhood transform. And I remember arguments with my wife about, you know, I wanted to send my kids to public school. My kids went to Hudson Guild, the preschool, in fact, uh, that's in the projects, the Ellen and Chelsea projects. Um, their first instructor when they were four years old was Whoopi Goldberg's mom. Whoopi Goldberg grew up in Elliott Chelsea. Uh, so I was open to PS 33, which is right there. Uh, you know, luckily my wife talked me out of it. We had some uh, passionate arguments. Um, that school was a failure then. This is back in the 80s. Uh, it's now, believe it or not, uh, been turned around. There are kids from all over the city coming to their special uh, education programs that they have there. Uh, so yeah, there are these cross currents that are happening. And I think the fact that Avenues is there is part of that. Um, it's, it's, I guess, you know, the challenge is, uh, look, I, I think your suggestion uh, is a bold one. Nobody in the political world yet has, I've even heard in the United States, utter that idea of getting rid of, pu of private school. Um, and there's a book that's come out recently on the whole battle of education, where we're going, called The Prize. And it uses Newark as a big example, where I spent 
uh, three years doing the Brick City Project, Cory Booker, uh, Sundance, Robert Redford. Uh, and we were there when uh, Zuckerberg came and pledged $100 million. And I think that at least the thesis of the prize is that you can have innovative ideas, you can bring in wealth and, um, and charter schools and even private schools, but if it's just top down and you don't get a buy-in from the students, the families, the teachers, the community, it's doomed to fail even if the ideas may be innovative, bold, original. Uh, the best way to get a buy-in, ultimately, is what you just suggested, which is that, hey, we're all in this together. How are we going to make it better? Yeah. Not that you can just run to the private school and you don't have to worry about what the school three blocks away from you is really doing. What's so great about New York, what attracted all of us, I was born in New York, but, you know, it's a cultural mix. It's a mix of ethnicities. It's a mix of people. It, every type of person in the world is somewhere in this city. And if you don't use that as part of what's educating, in other words, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. is, uh, and how that can be then turned into productivity, creativity, innovation, all of these things. If you just turn this into a gilded cage, yeah. That's sterile, lifeless. The irony is what attracted all the wealth, money, energy is the mix. And you kill it, what do you got? Yeah. So that's where a community like West Chelsea, you know, where this film is set, is interesting because, okay, it is one of the fastest, gentr it's almost what you would call hypergentrification. And the high line running through it has gone from being an eyesore to this catalyst to almost a land rush. Mm -hmm. Much of the money being uh, invested there is from all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's not just... It's a global city. It's now. a global city, and, and, and these condos that are going for $50, $60 million are being bought by Saudis and Chinese and Russian oligarchs. Uh, so how do you grow? How do you change? Because you can't stop that. But how do you do it in a way where you don't lose your soul? You don't lose that mix. Now, that is a huge challenge. We showed this film at the Havana Film Festival, which, you know, uh, the first two screenings outside New York were Seattle and Havana. Oh. Seattle was actually first, and, and that was interesting just to see, okay, it's such a microcosm, but can it be symbolic? Well, I was overwhelmed, you know. Oh. We're the new San Francisco. You need to come to our neighborhood. Oh, the Amazonication of our city. I mean, everything that was in that film I'm living with, I'm struggling with my daughter. Then, uh, and that was certainly, uh, you know, gratifying. Uh, went to Havana and I thought, well, how would this film ever play here? You know, okay, they like the title. That's fine. Uh, and Rosa, obviously, superstar. And I'm sorry we weren't able to bring her down because she is Spanish speaking. She's Puerto Rican. Um, but what was fascinating was how they all know they're on the verge of this historic transformation, which has already started, but now with Obama's uh, moves this spring and Castro's, you know, is accelerating. And so they were all fascinated by it's like, in a way, that's our whole island, our story, is how are we now going to enter the global economy, become part of this world, and yet not lose, as frustrated as we are with the old communism, we don't want to lose what makes us special. We don't want to just be like Puerto Rico or, you know, uh, just have McDonald's everywhere and Coca-Cola everywhere. So that's how they responded to the film. I thought that was fascinating. This is our challenge. Well, I think uh, probably the most, obviously, artful dimension of your film in my mind was that you did not assuage our anxiety with a, with a, what you might call, bullet points of a reform agenda. <laughs> it feels like you just showed us that in the context of inequality, this anxiety, this discomfort is here. It is to be dealt with. It's not to be suppressed or ignored. And it's up to us now to take the next step and address uh -huh. that it's real. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and I think also, I mean, I know at some of the screenings, you know, yeah, what's the solution? Uh, that may be a bit above my pay grade. 
uh, and more, you know, some of the stuff you guys are working on here. But I would say also that I think that um, what's amazing is that you, these young people, like you say, they, they, they're, this is the world they're growing up in. And it's very much every generation has its struggle, has its challenge. I came of age in the 60s, you know, so, so we had the great cultural struggle, uh, the anti-war struggle, you know, the civil rights struggle, the sexual liberation. Um, this generation, I think it really is, it's, it's, it's income inequality or, or economic justice and climate change. The, these are the great challenges that these young kids are growing up. And we had to worry about duck and cover and would there be a nuclear war and <laughs> yeah. all that craziness. But this is what they're dealing with. And, and I have to say one of the things that amazed me is just the, you know, the kind of articulateness and sense of self that even in the middle of this anxiousness, these kids were able to articulate. Uh, I think back to when I was in high school and my friends, <laughs> I'm not sure we could have spoken <clears throat> as eloquently, certainly as an eight-year-old, that was Rose's eight when uh, we started the film. She's amazing. Uh, her wisdom from uh, a young girl. Amazing. So uh, I think, you know, look, growing up in New York, any kid that grows up in New York is on a fast track, you know, in terms of being exposed to much more than you would be in the suburbs or, you know, out in rural America. But um, I think this is part of this generation's challenge, is trying to engage in how do we make this system fairer, more just, but without losing its energy, without losing its sense of, hey, I can go out there and do it on my own, you know, just yeah, like Danny, not, her brother, has. It's not know? for despondency or resignation. That's right. It's, it's the mountain that they have to climb. Exactly. But, uh, well, I, uh, I very much appreciate many of the films you've made, but, but this one touched me a great deal. And uh, like I said, the challenge is here. Well, and we Rob, all have to address it. Yeah, well, look, I appreciate what you're doing, uh, and uh, I look forward to having many more discussions like this uh, in the future as you create your television uh, <laughs> studio here and you get the word out. Uh, you guys are on the cutting edge, and uh, I appreciate you having me over today. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much.